What's up everyone, Thomas here with For Real. And as part of my coverage of the Seattle International Film Festival, I am here in Seattle talking with James Morosini, the writer, director, and co-star of the SIF selected film, I Love My Dad, which also is a South by Southwest award winner. So I kind of want to start there actually. I remember getting the email announcement that said narrative feature competition winner, I Love My Dad. Tell me more about like how you, like what that moment was like for you. Yeah, I certainly wasn't expecting it. Yeah, uh, and I remember on the you know we were competing against some films that I loved. Mm. So I was in the theater, kind of like, all right, how am I gonna, how am I gonna thank, or like, how am I gonna remain gracious when someone <laughs> else wins? Like, mm -hmm. I'll maybe give them a hug as they walk by. I'll like <laughs> make my face smile and I'll clap. <laughs> uh, but that and so when we won, I was like truly shocked. That's awesome. And I went up and I, I really didn't know what to say. I, I, my body <laughs> felt like I was actually in shock. So I like couldn't, I had a hard time like keeping it together. <laughs> um, and, um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's just really cool getting that degree of acknowledgement for something that you've worked so hard on. It's, right. it's really satisfying. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And congratulations again on that. That is a huge, huge moment for you. And I really hope that it opens uh, a lot of doors for you going forward. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's talk about I Love My Dad. Can you give a brief synopsis on what the film is about? Yeah, so the movie's about um, an estranged father who uh, is worried about his son and can't get in touch with him. His son just came out of uh, a self-harm rehab facility. Uh, and so without any other way to get in touch with him, he creates a profile of a pretty girl to just check in on him and then the son ends up falling in love with said pretty girl. Um, and the story is based on a kernel of, of something that actually happened to me and, and kind of explores, you know, with all the hijinks, this, this relationship. <laughs> it's, I, I remember when South by Southwest an, announced their lineup and I saw the title and I was like, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, it certainly caught my attention and be very quickly became a film that uh, that was on my short list of things to see at South By. Uh, and so I'm happy that I did. It, there is this level of cringe, I guess, yeah, yeah. Um, to how this plays out, kind of, I guess, as most would imagine with a premise like that. Um, catfishing is already kind of like a, a not good thing to, to be involved in, but then when it's between uh, you know, this dad and his son, there, it, it builds up to very interesting moments. Um, I'm interested in hearing more about your style of comedy and filmmaking. Like, yeah. how do you, um, or maybe, tell me more about yeah. what you do when it comes to like comedy and cringe and, and, and playing out these, these, yeah, you know, yeah. these kind of yeah. situations. Um, yeah, I, it's funny, but the title, when I tell somebody about the movie, I'm like, it's called I Love My Dad. And they go like, aw. <laughs> I'm like, well, wow. you know, maybe, see the movie. See the movie. Because <laughs> so it, it feels very, like, sincere and benign and sweet. Great. Uh, but then it's like, it has this other meaning to it. Um, in terms of my style of comedy, I, I guess I've never been a big joke guy. Mm -hmm. I just... I when someone makes a joke to me or I feel like I'm, I don't know, I'm kind of like, this is weird. Now I have to laugh at your joke. Great. Like I, even if I don't think it's funny and then if I don't laugh, I'm like a jerk. Uh -huh. I, I, that, I, I don't know, I've always just felt weird about jokes. Like mm -hmm. what a, like if I told a pun right now, like that'd be, be <laughs> such an interruption to our conversation. Right. It's like, all right, I guess you're performing uh, you're being a jokester now. I don't know. I, it makes yeah. me feel weird. Um, and a lot of things make me feel weird. And I feel like I'm very, I'm very sensitive to just like social weirdness. Mm -hmm. And it, for me, like cringe comedy is like my only way of like pointing to those things yeah. and being like, it's fucking weird, weird. right? <laughs> like that, that's weird. Like let's acknowledge that this is weird. Um, but I grew up on like, I grew up, reading a lot of reddit mm -hmm. and there's a specific subreddit called crin uh, like r cringe mm -hmm. and it's just all these like just brutal videos and they're the most engaging videos i think i've ever seen because you you can't look away but you also can't watch them <laughs> right you know um and it's like 
it's like somebody who's just like failing very publicly but mm-hmm. is pretending not to. Great. I, I, I don't know why I think it's so funny. Um, but just, it, it's like, I guess just watching someone in like an untenable situation where they're pretending everything's fine mm-hmm. uh, is, is just really <laughs> funny to me. Um, and um, yeah. Well, I certainly think it translated in this film very well. I mean, I, comedy is already a very difficult thing to do. I think some people find some things funny, others, uh, you know, may not. And so when you when you're doing a comedy film, you're just like taking this swing and hoping that it lands, right? Like going from your head onto film into being decoded by the audience. Um, and there are there is a, there's a lot in this film I think that that kind of rides that line of risk in comedy. And yeah. for for me, it it certainly pays off because there's there's also on top of the comedy this emotional co- uh, component to sure. it that I think is is very interestingly juxtaposed, but also blends very well. So maybe that's just my my compliments for the film. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I mean, I I think part of the reason making the film was appealing to me is because it had this. I, I, I was like, I think I can do this where I'm like making a very personal story, but also threading the needle of like using that toward greater comedy and and Mm -hmm. more cringe. Like it keeps it out of being jokey Mm -hmm. and it keeps it out of, um, it, it, it makes you have to lean in and engage with it. Right. Cause, and and it it doesn't let you go because you care about the characters. So you're, you're kind of like, you're on the ride with them, yeah. and you're that much more in these heightened, uh, awkward situations, mm-hmm. like we've all been in. And right. When we're in, it feels like we're very alone in those awkward situations where right. we're like, "Does anyone else <laughs> feel this or see this?" And right. I guess I see a movie like this, kind of s- giving voice to those to those feelings. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I guess I bring up your style of comedy because. After literally after I saw your, the title at South by, I was very interested, and so um, I went and watched your previous film. Oh, cool! Man. Free something, yeah. Uh, which again is that I think it, um, that was your directorial debut, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, and it is also kind of cringe comedy, right? Yeah, it's definitely. <laughs> yeah. Um, tell me more about that transition between making Three Something and making I Love My Dad. Yeah, I mean Three Something was a. a very, it was a micro, micro budget movie that my friend Sam and I produced mm-hmm. uh, on our own. Um, and we were the lead actors in it, and we were, you know, I was editing it, and I directed it. And it's, I mean, I still stand behind that movie. It's just a really different kind of movie. It's a lot more improvisational. <laughs> uh, it feels a lot looser narratively. Um, you know, I was 26 when I made it. Mm-hmm. I think uh, I hadn't really spent that much time learning how to uh, like structure a story mm-hmm. yet. Since then, I feel like I've invested a lot of time into just understanding story mechanics and right. how to make an audience care. And so for me, it was like w- we were just like, "What's the funniest thing that we can put in that movie?" But the evolution was like, you know, uh, learning how to tell a story like how a story works and then you know this movie was a lot bigger um you know the crew is often a hundred people or more and uh so you have to be a lot more precise because everything right. takes a lot longer and you have to try to get everyone you, you can't just have an idea and then do it right away mm-hmm. it, it kind of requires moving tons and tons of people along with you it, 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 with the slightest pivots yeah. Um, so I, you know, I, for a film like this, it was a lot more pre-planning and storyboarding the whole film and mm-hmm. like being really precise about what the film was before we made it, you mm-hmm. know? I have so many questions from there. I mean, yeah. because, uh, I, it sounds like there maybe is a lot more pressure to make something like I Love My Dad compared to Three Something. Um, and I mean, you pulled it off and you made it happen, but it really leads me into the question of like, you're, you were, were mainly an actor, um, and you've done acting, uh, on TV and shorts and things like that. Um, but then, of course, Three Something was your step into directing and writing. Um, what was it that made you decide that you wanted to get into that space? It's funny. It, it actually happened in kind of the inverse way, where I've, I've always written and directed. I've always made stuff. Mm-hmm. 
through high school, it, like there are you know videos of me as a little kid being like directing stuff, yeah. and um, so I always wanted to direct, um, but I, I I guess I just was intimidated by it for the longest time. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I guess I've always looked at them as kind of the same thing, and mm -hmm. and like if I have my finger on the pulse of a story, and it makes sense for me to be in it, it's just more fun for sure. me and I, I think I'm able to tell it better. Sometimes it's hard to communicate to an actor exactly the tone of something. Mm -hmm. And if you can just, it's <laughs> fun like having a feeling of what you want it to be and then just being like, not having to verbalize it, but instead just like get in front of the camera and like do the thing that you're feeling. I totally know how that is. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly no actor or director or anything like that, but I'm, I, what I am is a control freak. Yeah. And so I, I, I have that same kind of feeling sometimes when it comes to the creative work that I do, where I could delegate it to someone and I could try to explain what I'm looking for, or I can just do it, right? Right, right. Um, but that comes with challenges. And so... And part of it is like yeah. out of, was out of necessity, honestly. Like right, at, right, at right. a stage in my career where I was like, it was a lot of time just in my apartment figuring out like, all right, how do I make this a career? Mm -hmm. And so I, I felt like, okay, you, I have to be producing stuff. You know, I started with a, a web series that my friend and I made, uh, and then it was just like, okay, how do I make a feature? And then you know, and making a lot of shorts and stuff, but like it just came out of, honestly, terror of mm -hmm. like, how does this, how do you make a living doing this? Um, and so I knew I had to really study my writing and directing and, and get become proficient in mm -hmm. those areas. Wow, I mean that, and that's fantastic. There's certainly, um, and of, of course, uh, Three Something was very amusing to watch. But there is certainly a production difference between Three Something and I Love My Dad, which identifies this very interesting growth for you in your career. Um, I, I'm actually jumping ahead. I wanted to ask this later, but like, what do you see for yourself going forward after? And I know that I love my dad just premiered like last yeah, month, right? Yeah. So, but what do you see for yourself in your career um, going forward from here? Are you going to stay writer, actor, director? Are you going to um, move into one of those spaces by themselves? Like, uh, what, what's your vision for that? Yeah, I think for me, I'm I'm kind of taking it as it comes. Um, I. I would only put myself in something mm -hmm. if I thought it really made sense for me to be in it. Um, yeah, I think you addressed that question at South by someone yeah. had asked if there was uh, if you were if you intended on, on playing yourself or yeah. if you were going to um, uh, get uh, cast someone for that role. Yeah, and you just you said that it was something that just kind of made sense for you. Yeah, it's so case by case. Mm -hmm. Like if I want to, if I'm thinking that directorially I wanted to have a lot more flourish and a lot more uh, camera movement or I, I, I want it to be more visual, mm -hmm. then I probably wouldn't act in it. Right. But if I'm thinking that the story's value is more so situational mm -hmm. and it makes sense, you know, with I Love My Dad, it, it's like I tried to stay out of the way as much as I could directorially mm -hmm. so that you are not super conscious of the filmmaking, that it's, that it's, uh, a little more straightforward so that we could just really be there with the characters. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, uh, you know, moving forward, I, I have stuff that I'm working on that is like, are these big spectacle pieces. I mean, the thing that brought me to movies originally were like these, you know, drive-in movie theater, blockbuster, yeah. huge films. And so I want to be making movies like that that are also equally as weird as I Love My Dad yeah. and that take similar risks, but that have also the same amount of heart mm -hmm. where you're kind of bringing an indie heart to a blockbuster, um, a, a blockbuster. Um, mm -hmm. and, Which uh, is unfortunately missing in a lot of is. blockbusters it's, nowadays. It certainly is. Yeah. yeah. So I admire that aspiration. That, uh, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's definitely the goal. And yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out exactly how to do it. Yeah. Um, what films inspire your filmmaking? I don't know if there's a particular genre that you like or, or even if maybe you're working outside of what you prefer to watch. But like, yeah. can you think of films that inspire what you do? Or is this just, or do you just kind of do it, make it up as you go. I think it's like I'm 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 such I'm a film lover 
across genre. Nice. And so when I think of a story idea, I start to kind of uh, figure out what films are its uh, predecessor in a, mm -hmm. in a sense, like what are audiences potentially gonna be going to this film with already uh, a palette uh, of films in their minds. Mm -hmm. And I try to really study those films mm -hmm. and understand I want to make sure that it's different enough, but that there's maybe some genre uh, that it that it's within genre, so mm -hmm. that audiences can understand what they're signing up for. Um, but yeah, man. So it's it's different for every. I mean, the movies that I love aren't necessarily movies that uh, I've gotten an opportunity to work on yet. Okay. Movies like The God. I mean, like yeah. they're they're pretty standard. Uh, they're pretty standard movie. I mean, it's like if I have a list of like my top 100 films on my letterbox. Yes, and I, letterbox I is great for that. Yeah, I mean, my, my top 100 are like here. I'll, I'm not gonna read all top 100, but my, I'm, I'm interested in at least some of them. Uh, yeah. So like my my top 10 are um, the Bear, this okay. French film. Okay. Uh, the Godfather, yes. Tony Erdman. This Russian nice. film called Come and See, uh -huh. Godfather Part Two, yeah. uh, Michael Haneke's The White Ribbon, mm -hmm. uh, William Friedkin's Sorcerer, uh, Michael Haneke's The Piano Teacher, All right. Scenes from a Marriage, Apocalypse Now, Harkirian Kess. I'll go to twelve. <laughs> uh, but you know, Haneke's work is really interesting because there's there's like a, there's there's a lot of awkward comedy mm -hmm. in his work, but it's also done the part. His, his stuff is very formalistic and can feel kind of austere, but he he uh, he definitely plays with that same level of tension. Uh, there's an Iranian filmmaker named Oscar Farhadi. He made a movie called The Hero this year that just blew me away, and he, he his movies all pose these difficult moral questions that make kind of the problem at the center of their films really tangible where you're like I don't know what I would do mm -hmm. if I was in this situation either um, growing up it was like a lot of watching Judd Apatow movies and, and yeah. like just imagine like just they made me laugh so hard and they were always very inspiring to me but it's it's kind of uh, when I think about the work I'm interested in making it's like taking it's uh, kind of taking drawing from all of these influences like mm -hmm. these like highbrow kind of art housey films but then also like jackass and mm -hmm. i think filmmakers like spike jones do this really well where they blend the high and the low and and it's like it his films don't feel they never feel pretentious they just feel like they're you know bringing together a lot of different elements yeah, you should teach a film 101 class. <laughs> you have a lot of great uh, recommendations there, and, and I think this very uh, um, unique thing, especially I think that people our age tend to go towards blockbusters. I sure. talk to a lot of my friends, and um, which there's nothing wrong with blockbusters. There's certainly a place in our in our society for that. But but yeah, the the art of cinema and the the ability to deconstruct it and 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 then for you reconstruct it in a, in a different way. That's yeah, a, it's really so awesome much thing. of it is like. As a filmmaker watching movies and being like you're kind of you have this second voice in your head going like paying attention to how it's hitting you mm -hmm. and I'll watch movies where I'm like even if I'm emotionally floored by it and I'm crying mm -hmm. there's a part of my brain going how did they do that how did yeah. they make me do that like and, and that part of my brain never goes away and when it does then I'm even more amazed that mm -hmm. they that they were able to make me forget the crap. I, mm -hmm. I recently rewatched Saving Private Ryan, and I was yeah. having those experiences where I'm just like, "How is he doing this? It, it feels <laughs> like magic." Yeah, movie magic. That's yeah. Uh, that's 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 what it is. Sometimes it's unexplainable. But um, you know what? It's interesting because we we've talking about I love my dad and the comedy and cringe and awkwardness and and all of that. But it's it's. What's really interesting about the film is that, uh, like I mentioned, there's a juxtaposition there um, that also comes in the form of your your character Franklin, um, you know, dealing with a very serious subject matter, which is you know the self harm, um, you know, a, 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 it alludes to a suicide attempt. Um, how, 
I don't know, like how did you approach writing a comedy with with that being such a prominent component of this character? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've struggled with anxiety and depression my whole life. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm someone who's very up and down. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, through that, I, I feel like I'm often, that's why I like comedy and why mm -hmm. I lean to comedy, because I, like, can't, it's harder for me to, like, hang out in super dark mm -hmm. uh, genres for too long, because mm -hmm. I'm kind of there a lot of the time already. Interesting. Uh, and, um, but in, yeah, I mean, in terms of, you know, I, I think um, things like uh, self-harm or, you know, when they happen in real life, it's, they're, they're not these broad paintbrushes of feeling. Mm -hmm. There's not this like sanctimony around them. It's like everyone is trying to make light of it and mm -hmm. trying to bring people out of those places. You're, right. you're not like hanging out in those spots mm -hmm. where you're just collectively engaging in this despair. Like, mm -hmm. you know, when things go bad, that's when people make jokes and are like trying to find levity. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in terms of the, like for me with this story, everything came back to the, to just like narrative structure of what's gonna make the situation as tense and as engaging as possible and it was important for me that Franklin is at the lowest point of his life. He needs help that he's not getting, and he, he's in a really dangerous place, so it kind of poses this question to the audience, um, would you catfish your son to save their life? If that's the only thing you could do. And, and I don't know, I, when I think of how I would answer that question, I, I don't know. I, I, get, I, I guess I would. <laughs> yeah, right. You know? And I think that, that that happens so often in this film is that there are voices of reason here. He's not kind of, uh, um, uh, uh, what's, I'm sorry, what's the uh, um, dad's name? Uh, uh, Chuck. Chuck. Yeah. It's not that Chuck has this idea and then just kind of goes for it without consulting anyone about right. it. He actually, he, he has voices of reason along the way saying you shouldn't do this. Right. But every time he's told not to, it, he has kind of a understandable reason to keep doing it. Um, and obviously this comes to a head with, uh, in the conclusion and also leads to some very interesting, awkward scenes. But, uh, but yeah, I think that uh, that nuance, I guess, of like, this is, there isn't a straightforward answer to that. Straightforward answer to that. Like maybe I would. I don't know. You know, it's 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 like it's a conundrum, and I think that this movie tackles that um, that nuance really in a very interesting way. Thank you. Yeah, I, I uh, it was so important to me that you're that people are pushing against Chuck mm -hmm. in the way that the audience would want to if they could talk to him. Yeah, and that you're you're kind of building this argument and I, I really see films as almost a debate or, or an argument around a theme or an idea where you're having some people and, and within arguments or debates uh, the back and forth causes kind of an emergent uh, idea at the end of it that mm -hmm. neither party would have come to on their own without being right. pushed and having to defend their position and evolve their position. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I wanted that to be the case with Chuck where he's getting the opportunity to confront the audience mm -hmm. and say things where the audience, then it takes them a second to come up mm -hmm. to come up with what they would say next. And so then they're with him because they're right. like, I guess you have a point. Yeah. And it makes the audience complicit in what he's doing because you, you you know, yes. <laughs> once you've said your part and the person says something back to you that makes sense, you're kind of like, all right, man, I guess let's see how this goes. You know? it, yes, absolutely. And I mean, I can talk forever about like being that engaged with the film. I think that that was one of my concerns going into it is like, this sounds so off the wall. How does he get away with it? Well, you get some very, very good points throughout the film. I would ask the question like, would you, should you still be doing this? Or maybe you should be stopping, but then a character in the film We'll tell him that. Right. And it's like, okay, well, he has the warnings that I'm trying to tell right, him, right, but, right. but we're just going along, and it, and it makes sense. It's you know? a conversation. I mean, even <laughs> though it's, you're watching it on the screen, like yeah. it needs to feel like a conversation, mm -hmm. and I think the filmmaker's responsibility is to be really like tuned into the room mm -hmm. in the same way a stand-up comic would, yeah. where they're kind of reading the room, except you're doing that 
ahead of time and you're imagining how things are gonna land in terms of how they're landing with you or screening audiences or whatever, but like you're trying to calibrate, okay, what, where are people gonna be right now and how can I keep them engaged in this conversation? So Great. that if it feels like you're losing them, you have to bring them back <laughs> on board. Great. And go like, I, you know, say, you know, with the film, I know I'm losing you here, but like, you <laughs> let's, know. Let's bring it back, yeah, right? Let's, it, let's get you back inv involved and invested. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, no, that's awesome. I could be here forever talking about this film, but um, I do want to bring it to a close. Uh, and I guess I am interested in what the future of this film looks like. Um, are there any distribution offers? Yeah. Is it going to more festivals? Yeah, so we just sold the film to Magnolia. Congratulations. Thank that's you. That's exciting. Yeah, so yes. we're going to be coming out in theaters in August. Awesome. Which I'm really excited about. August 5th for theaters, August 12th on demand. Very cool. Um, we're going to some other festivals. Yeah. And uh, yeah, man, I'm just excited for tons of people to see it. That's very cool. Yeah. I, I am as well. I can't wait to talk to more people about it and, you know, have these conversations. And, yeah. And yeah. really, and also see the re people's reactions. Yeah, I think, that's I think the, the next time, fun part, I, I unfortunately have not been able to see it in a theater, which is why I'm happy that it's getting yeah. a theatrical distribution because I, I'm confident if when I do get the chance to see it in theaters it'll be fun I've seen the movie I know what's going to happen it'll be fun to see like how the audience is yeah. reacting yeah, right? yeah. um I mean you guys uh, had a screening was it last night yeah yeah how, how did that it turn was out? great I mean, yeah. it was a full house nice I feel like the crowd here really got it yeah yeah, yeah. um and we have another one at 2 30 today mm -hmm. which I'm excited about very um, cool but yeah I mean, I mean very warm room good I, I felt like everyone got was able to get down with the story good 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 any last statements for people who might be interested in seeing I, I Love My Dad? I mean, I guess go see it if go you can. It. Uh, <laughs> you, don't have, you don't have to listen to what I'm telling you to do. But, uh, <laughs> well, I'm telling you to go watch it. It, it, really, it really is a is an interesting uh, concept, and it's played out in, in such a cringeworthy way. But uh, thank you so much for talking with me about really the film. I really enjoyed it. Man. Yeah. Thank you. And for everyone out there watching, thank you for tuning in. Until next time I hop on another one of these interviews, this is for real.